Our next speaker needs no introduction. In fact, he introduced the word swagger to me just a couple of years ago. And I hired a swagger coach, and the reason I hired this guy was because he's helped Carl. I'm talking about Carl Lentz, our next speaker, so much. So just watch this. Two years ago, I just decided things weren't really going that well. My jokes weren't working. People weren't laughing. Even my wife and kids, they were like, you know, rolling their eyes. That's basically when I hired a swagger coach. Yeah, I've, I've been a swagger coach for about, oh, about 20 years. I've, I've coached a few people like Chuck Norris, uh, Marky Mark, and uh, the Funky Bunch. Most of the Funky Bunch. When they approached me, I, I, I knew I needed to maintain maximum level of swagger at all times. The first thing in the morning, I make sure that he gets a big bowl of swagger jacks. And then we move on to the morning mirror mantra. You're a swagger source Rex. I'm a swagger source Rex. In the beginning, Ed's wardrobe was just terrible. No, Ed, that outfit is no, no nauseous. We've been over this. Try again. But with some gentle criticism, he seems to be getting it now. Now you're looking swag, player. You know, I speak for a living, and this guy really knows his stuff. You could say that um, I have been key in making Ed Young what he is today. They're gonna love this. Whole nother level. Whole, whole, no, 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 Is anybody ready to go to a whole nother level? Basically, I owe everything to OG. That's what I'm about, changing life. Man, I've had to inspire Carl like that. I've had to slap him upside of his little head. You know, the dress, the look, the tat, the no shirt. Carl and I played basketball at my house last C3. I abused him, he couldn't guard me. Broke his ankles on a couple of, of crossovers. I'm 50 years old, he still couldn't hang with me. He played at NC State, I played at FSU. Any questions? None. Let's all right now start to chant. Carl, Carl, that's right, Carl, stand up, Carl, Carl, and let's give a ridiculous round of applause to my main man, Carl Lentz! It is uh, such an honor to be here, uh, it, it's just a uh... A real honor to be on this stage, and I come here to learn. And um, you know, I'm 33 years old. My wife and I have been pastoring the church for a year now, and um, we don't know what we're doing. That's why we come to places like this to find out. So to be able to contribute at all, uh, it's a huge honor. And I would like to just thank you, sir, for letting me stand on this pulpit and speak to these amazing people. Can we thank Ed and Lisa for pioneering a, a whole fresh move of God? Come on, let's really thank them. The Swagger Five. He kept, he kept tweeting the word swag. I said, Ed, you know that word was extinct in 2002, right? And uh, right before I pray, just want to say thank you for all those of, uh, you know, Hillsong, New York City. It's about a year old, and um, it's been a testament, I guess, of a really faithful God and faithful friendships, whether it's Ed and Lisa sewing into us. My friend Judah is here. I don't know if Stephen Furtick is here, but a couple guys that just keep coming through when you need them. That's why C3 is important, because you can meet people on your left and on your right who are going to be there for you when you need them the most. And uh, our church is, yeah, you can clap if you love people, I guess. And um, it's been awesome. 
Uh, we've seen a lot of people get saved. We had a record-breaking week this week at Hillsong, New York City. We had 12 kids in our children's department. 12. It's a breakthrough. And also, uh, Lee was amazing. That last session was just killing me. And I will say this, I got saved when I was 19 uh, for the 12th time at uh, Wave Church in Virginia Beach. Steve Kelly, the senior pastor, is here, and he is amazing. He's going to preach soon. And I got saved. The first book someone gave me was A Case for Faith. It's pretty much, other than the Bible, the only book I needed at the time. And uh, it's just unbelievable to be able to hear him speak. And uh, that book was special. Who's grateful for people like that who put it on paper? Yeah, okay. Well, I'm going to pray. And uh, I'm a preacher. And it, I don't, it's the most intimidating thing ever to speak right here, I'll be honest with you. Because some of the best preachers in the world are staring at you. And I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm not as good as they are. But I'm going to give you what I got. I'm going to preach like a dying man to dying people. And our hope is that uh, we serve a God that's good enough to take the ordinary and make it special. So if you are hungry and desperate for God to move, will you pray with me? If you have any passion in you, can you lift your hands towards heaven just as a sign of surrender? Jesus, I thank you that we are here right now, Lord, not to do a religious deal, not to come to a conference, but Jesus, we cannot leave the way that we walked in, Lord. Our world is dying without you. And I pray, Lord, every pastor that's here, every church that is represented, God, I pray you give us fresh fire. Lord, you'd open up our eyes to see things that we have needed to see forever. Lord, you'd help us to hear your voice like never before. We cry out for our cities. We cry out for our friends that have yet to find you, Lord. And we pray that you continue to open up heaven over our country and over our churches, Lord. And I pray right here and now, Lord, that you would do what only you can do. If there's one person in here that's discouraged, Lord, I pray you would lift their head and remind them that God is for them and nobody can be against them, Lord. I pray if anybody came in with a heavy burden, they would leave here smiling, knowing that you are on their side. Jesus, we love you, and we give you all the praise. And if you believe it, can somebody give God a shout up in here? Come on, let's give God a big shout if you believe it, if you love him. Come on, let's really give God some praise like we're at a Cowboys game. Why don't you give somebody a hug and uh, take a seat. Make sure it's a hug of 20 seconds or longer that makes it Christian. I think I'm going to leave the keyboard up here. What do you think? We'll go Pentecostal. Anybody glad you're here? Yeah? Look at your neighbor and say, you look good. This is Texas. There's a lot cooler languages and English being spoken. Look at somebody else and say, you look muy caliente. Everybody watching at home on an iPhone, wherever you might be, we love you. This is your first time at C3 Conference. We're glad you're here. Don't feel like you're on the outside looking in. None of us know what we're doing at all. We're glad you're here. I'm going to uh, just preach something that's on my heart. I honestly rack my brain and pray to the Lord, what can you say to some of the world's finest leaders and some of you who might not be on a church staff? You're a huge part of the church that you're in. And it couldn't be done without you. And I pray this is going to bless you. So I'm uh, from Virginia. There's some Virginians down here in the front row. And uh, I always like to say I'm from the South where people will shout you down as you preach. So I know this is a reserved crowd. But uh, feel free to say amen, holler, preach it. Say that's for my neighbor. They need it. I got it all together. I was preaching at an inner city church one time and I just was just going for it. And uh, some lady stood up in the front row and just started swaying at me. And I stopped. She said, don't stop, white boy. That means it's good. Preach on. I said, okay. So I'm going to preach. Write this down. I've called this uh, message, Fight Now or Forever Hold Your Peace. Fight Now or Forever Hold Your Peace. Look at somebody and say, Fight Now. Look back at them and say, Quit talking to me. I don't know you. It's getting awkward. Quit doing that. Now, have you ever uh, realized you had access to something really great just a little bit too late? Maybe you needed money, didn't think you had any, got home later, and you had 50 bucks in your pocket. Or maybe if you're from a city like me in uh, New York, we have to go from Brooklyn to Manhattan uh, every day, and you have this huge decision on whether you should pick the left lane or the right lane. The difference could be three hours. And sometimes you pick the left one, and you sit there in dead traffic, and you see some guy on a skateboard just going by the other lane. And you're thinking, man, I could have been there. I had access to that lane. Or maybe you are um, into movies, and you know one of the greatest movies of our generation. 
who's dumb and dumber. Shout me down, Pastor Stovall. And there's that scene where he's freezing and his hands are freezing and his friend says, uh, I, got, I got another pair of gloves. He's like, this whole time you had two pairs of gloves? He's like, we're in the Rockies. And he chokes and he says, Harry, your hands are freezing. This is, this is Bible. I think sometimes you're going to get caught in life where you look back and realize you had access to something great and you did not know about it. And I feel like the memo uh, from heaven for our church, maybe for yours, is that the window of opportunity to reach our world, it is wide open. Like never before, we have an opportunity to lead people to Jesus. And if we will step up and fight right now for the things that we believe in, we will see more victory than we have ever seen before. Victory in people's homes, victory in our streets. If we will step up and fight for what's right and fight for the gospel and fight for the name of Jesus and fight for those who do not know they are worthy of fighting for, fighting for those people who have no voice, fighting for those people who are enslaved in our communities. If we will step up and fight, we're going to see God do things like we have never seen before. Is anybody looking forward to a move of God like that? Come on, somebody. Make some noise if you are. Fight now. We'll forever hold your peace. What I mean by forever hold your peace, we have a saying in our church, if you ain't helping, you ain't helping. And I feel like, you know, many people, they're not fighting, but they're complaining about the church, about their pastor. And our thing, you know, once a year, we get criticized at Hillsong, New York City. <laughs> Just, that was funny. <laughs> Died right there. And I always, first thing I check with somebody is, are you a part of the church, ours? Are you a part of some other church? No, you're not? Okay, well, no thank you on your criticism. Because if you're not in the fight, you have no right to talk about those who are. And normally, the people who are criticizing the church, they're not fighting anybody. They're in their grandma's basement, and they pastor a blog. They haven't fought anybody in years. And I feel like the word for us is fight now. I feel like heaven's saying fight now or hold your peace. Because we have an opportunity as churches, fallible, normal, filled with human churches, to step up and say, God, here I am. He's not looking for the gifted. He's looking for the available. And if we will fight, we're going to win our cities. Anybody looking forward to that? Can you write this down real quick? I'm going to give you the answer and the problem. Here it is. Nobody else is coming. We're all we got. This fight is ours and ours alone. It's the solution. It's also the problem. We are all we got. Look at somebody and say, we're all we got. We're all we got. <laughs> say it like, hey, we all we got. We all we got. I think sometimes Christians and even churches, we can get caught waiting for a brighter day to come and forget that we are the brighter day. People are waiting for somebody to come save the day he did. He died on a cross. He put the power in the people. And we're all we got. I don't know why we're always looking to the government. I love the president. We'll continue to pray for who's in office, but I'm not waiting for the government to change our country. I'm not waiting for the mayor of New York City to open up the kingdom to us because Jesus already gave us those keys. We are all we got. God chose us to change our world. And I'm going to read a part of the Bible that I love. Did you bring a Bible? There's so much controversy about gospel-centered stuff. Sometimes I wonder if it's even okay to... If you have a Bible, can you hold it up real quick? Let me see what we're working with at a church conference. Someone say, I love my Bible. If your Bible's glowing, I don't want to see it. I only respect Bible with pages. Go to, <laughs> go to 1 Samuel, quickly, if you can. 1 Samuel chapter 17. I mean, if you're new to the Bible, it's about David and Goliath. Anybody ever heard those names? If you're new to church, you know, no shame in the table of contents. Take your time. Don't be faking it and be all up in Ruth right now. <laughs> Somebody's going to know. Anybody single in here? Let's see three. Anybody married? Yeah, married people are like, yeah. Single people, give me a wave again. Have a quick look around. Don't act like you don't want to. You know you do. <laughs> When you come to a conference, highlight your Bible with as many highlighters as you can. Sit next to somebody you like and just hold it out there. The more colors, the more spiritual you're going to look. <laughs> just trying to help somebody out. First Samuel, here it is. 
We're all we got. Somebody say, we're all we got. David said to the Philistine, if you don't know this story, basically, there's a guy taunting the people of God. Quick summary. And nobody was doing anything about it. And a little shepherd who was delivering some cheese said, is anybody going to do something about this guy? Nobody was doing anything. He said, basically, I'm going to do something. And that's where we pick up the story. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin. Also, this is the first biblical account of trash talk, mid-game. A lot of athletes are afraid if they get saved, they got to stop talking. No, sir. About to see David go at it, mid-game. You come uh, against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'm going to strike you down, and I'm going to cut off your head. In my imagination, I can just see him shaking his head. (laughs) I'm going to cut off your head. Today, I will give you the carcasses of your entire army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know there is a God in Israel. It's amazing. All those gathered here will know that it is the Lord who saves. The battle is the Lord's, and he's going to give all of you into our hands as he moves closer To attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him, reaching into his bag and taking out a stone. He slung it, and he struck the Philistine on the forehead. Sank into the forehead, he fell face down to the ground. David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck him down. He ran, he stood over him, he took the Philistine's sword, and he drew it, and after he killed him, he cut off his head with his own sword. That is gangster. I read it the other day, and I thought, isn't that indicative of our times? The things that the devil has sent to kill our communities, we're going to take them, and we're going to send them right back where they came from. We broke into a club the other day to baptize people in what is normally not used for baptisms. (laughs) And I just told our, our church, you know, we meet in a club. Well, right now, it's the house of God. Somebody built this place to be filled with debauchery. We're going to fill it with the presence of God. Anything in our community that the devil's tried to kill us with, we're going to take it back. Now, I just want to use a little bit of symbolism real quick. I mean, for our church, Goliath represents New York City. Maybe it represents your city. It's big and it's bad, and people are intimidated by it, and it talks a lot. And David kind of represents the local church. Doesn't look like much. People don't know what's inside. But if, but if, the, if David knows who he's serving and who gave him the rocks and who taught him how to throw, it's okay. If no one else thinks we can do it, we have faith in the one who sent us. And maybe this will help you. You cannot allow in this fight the enemy or this world to occupy land in your life or in your church. He has not earned the right to take. Just want you to look across maybe the scope of your church and your life. And if there are areas where maybe the devil has tried to take things that he is not owed, you got to at some point have a righteous indignation rise up and you say, wait a second, I'm a Christian. Jesus sent me to my city. He sent me to leave my church. And the devil, he's not owed this land. He is not owed these people. I'm going to start fighting for some things again because they are not his. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm just around a lot of defeated Christians sometimes. You ever met somebody who's so negative? They just feel, I I, I talk to them all the time. Well, you know, I know God is good, but the recession's bad. And I just, you know, I'm glad I got a job, but everyone else is losing theirs. I know my time's coming. I woke up today, and the wind was blowing, and my arthritic knee started acting up, and I just could see it in the clouds. It's a bright day, but I could see the clouds rolling in. I just don't know if I'm going to make it. I'm just going to try to hold the fort down until Jesus parts those clouds on a white horse that comes down and saves the day, because I just don't know if I can make the devil is a liar, but he's telling some good ones, because I'm starting to believe it. I just... No. At some point, you got to say, no, thank you. My thought life, that's mine. It's not the devil's. My marriage, it seems like it's getting pulled apart. No, sir, that's the Lord's. I'm bringing it back. You're not owed this land, devil. I'm going to fight for it. My church feels like it's going through a struggle. Well, I'm going to fight. I'm not going to give in. You know, I've got, I've got daughters. I've got two of them. And i got a son named Roman. And i got a picture of Ava. Can you guys throw that up there just so you can see what I'm working with? There you go. Uh-huh. I got knives and guns and stuff. And, you know, when we moved from Virginia to Brooklyn, it was a big face step for us because we just thought, you know, God, it's, it's a huge thing to leave Virginia where we have yards and fences and guns and, like, streets and houses and yards and grass, streets, nice people, and move to Brooklyn to plant a church. And they go to a school, and it's so ghetto, it's called PS31. They don't even name the schools in Brooklyn. 
and I love my little girl, and I just thought, you know, the attack on her life is starting early. And I wasn't prepared to talk about some of the things I've had to talk to her about, but she came home one day from school, and, and Laura, my wife, went into her room, and she had looked uh, up something in her little phone, a little search engine, that she shouldn't even know how to put that sentence together. And I came home, and Laura told me about it, and I just looked at her, and Laura and I both went outside, and we lit ourselves on fire, and then... <laughs> just thought both called our parents and I just thought I don't know what I'm gonna do I don't know who is talking to my girl about this stuff but it's not happening on my watch I said what can I do we were going to check out Hillsong Paris because there's a thriving church there and I was going to speak there I said I'm gonna take her with me and we're gonna have this talk in France you know in the Eiffel Tower also making it impossible for any guy to ever impress her on a date <laughs> and you know we sat there and I said Ava I said, who, who told you about that? Who told you to well, put that in your phone? And she said, Dad, it was some fourth grade boy who came up and he told us to look at our phones and to put those words in there. And I didn't see anything. I said, okay, girl, listen, firstly, you know, uh, because the first thing she said to Laura was, don't tell Daddy. I said, why would you be afraid to tell Daddy? I'm the first one to need to tell. Secondly, the next time a boy walks up to you in the fourth grade, I want you to stab him right in the stomach. <laughs> and then get the address of where he lives so I can go talk to his dad. But I said, you just need to walk away. I said, let's talk about sex, Ava. Seven years old, here we go. Here's what God says about it. Here's who, what we believe about it. You know, here's how you got here. Your mom looks good, and there you are. <laughs> yeah, that's all you need to know right now. But what kind of dad would I be if I just saw my daughter typing something, and oh well, I hope somebody else is gonna leave my daughter, hope somebody else is gonna fight for her, hope somebody else is gonna come through. No, sir, she's my girl, it's my daughter. I don't know why I'm so weepy. Running to church will make you crazy. Just think there are people we need to fight for. And if you're here today and the devil's been trying to trick you, pastor or leader, and the thing, and you can't do it, you can do it. You can get up and fight again. Your church will see a better day. It might be a tough valley, but you're not going to camp in it. You're going to get through it. And I don't have time to read it, but if you could, just, you know, check it out later. Ephesians. The Bible's clear. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is in you. Two weapons we fight with, and then we're done. We're going to pray for people. That's all right with you. Is this okay? We can shut it down right now. Don't you love when preachers say that? They don't mean that. Is this okay? If you leave now, it's just awkward. Two things. Write this down. Two weapons that we fight with. You ready? Number one, if we're going to fight this fight, there's a weapon called purity. If you allow sin to find a home in your life, please do not be surprised if your gun malfunctions when you need it the most. And I know it's kind of random to talk about purity. Normally we leave this to the high schoolers. Guess what? It still matters when you're running churches. The weapon called purity, and there's this play on verses. If you guys throw it up there real quick, Psalm 24, I'm going to read it real quick. That clock is ticking. It's demonic. I heard that Stephen Furtick, one of the greatest preachers in the world, stopped right on 25. I thought, I'm not happy about that. <laughs> Psalm 24 had a new guy come to our church. He's like, my favorite book in the Bible is Palms. <laughs> so you can, you can call it whatever you want as long as you read it. <laughs> who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in this holy place? He who tithes a lot and says the right things. It goes to church for a long period of time. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. He who does not lift up his soul to an idol. And then you go over to Proverbs chapter 28. I love it. It's a verse I gave to my son. The wicked flees though nobody pursues them. You ever met somebody who's so paranoid? They'd be like, hey man, what'd you do last night? What do you mean what'd I do? You follow me around while you got something? What do you mean what did I do? The wicked flee, though nobody pursues them, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. If you want to fight this fight, there's just no way around it. Purity is the only weapon that's going to get it done for our churches. You can't have a little bit of you, a little bit of me, and a little bit of Jesus. This is not a cocktail. It is a straight shot of Jesus. There's no mixture. There's no little bit of sex and a little bit of purity and a little bit of hate and a little bit of love. Like Lee said, we got to really live what we're believing. 
And our world can't figure out what we're saying because we're saying one thing and doing another. And we got a little bit of this on Sunday, a little bit of that on Sunday. There comes a point when you got to realize if I want all access to heaven, God's going to need all access to my life. And we don't graduate from a place where we got to be on our knees saying, Lord, keep my heart pure, keep my thoughts pure. Any areas in my life that stuff has creeped in, Lord, please help me keep these hands clean. I like to say some people are sporks. They're not spoons and they're not forks, they're sporks. Nobody likes a spork. If I want a spoon, I'm going to get a spoon. If I want a fork, I'm going to get a fork. But the only people who don't get invited to barbecues are sporks because they're they're in the middle. I feel like some churches could be accused of being a spork. What do you stand for? What do you believe? Sometimes I'd rather be really wrong than be in the middle misunderstood. I feel like our country is crying out for somebody to lead them. Churches who will say, even if it's politically incorrect, this is who we are. This is what we believe. This is where we're going to take you. This is who Jesus is. And the mixture's killing us. It's what you get when you mix the wrong stuff. You get a mutation. At the end of the day, if we can fight for purity in our churches, we're going to win this war. This is not the season. As we just saw Whitney Houston, a legend, you know, pass away too soon. The devil's not looking to wound you. He's looking to kill you not looking to make Christians, you know, quietly suffer. He's looking to humiliate you publicly. And we can fight this with purity. And number two is we close. It's a weapon I like to call worship. Choose to praise God when you're going through it, not just when you get it. You know, churches and Christians, we are notorious for You know, talking about how good God is on the mountaintop, I really believe in this fight, if you can choose to worship and use it as a weapon, which you hit on Pastor Stovall earlier, you might not even need the victory because as you worship, you realize you already got the victory the moment Jesus set you free, so you're okay. We're going to leave you with Paul and Silas. Go to Acts real quick and we're done. Is this all right? You glad you came to C3? Now, if you have youth pastors, you know, Steve Kelly, I don't know where he is, but he brought me to this many times, you know, as I was growing up in his church. And it's the best thing you can do is spend the money, do what you got to do, but get your teams here. Let them see what God's doing somewhere else. It's just going to bless them. Acts chapter 16. If you're there, say, I'm there. Somebody say, preach it. Context, two guys locked up in jail. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Why? When you worship, people will watch. Suddenly, there was a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prisons were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everybody's chains came loose. Why? When you worship, you can break the chains off of somebody else's life, even if they don't even want it to happen. So we got worship leaders challenging people. Come on, lift your hands. Why do we have to do that? If you can just lift your hands, maybe somebody behind you could barely make it to church today. But because you worship, something in their life gets free. The jailer woke up and he saw the prison doors. He drew his sword. He was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. Worship will even give you compassion for your enemies. The jailer called for lights rushed in, fell trembling before them, said, what must I do to be saved? Your worship, your loss can be somebody else's gain if you worship. As I leave you there, I just want to help you see, I think the story is preposterous. You know, when you're at your worst, the last thing you want to do is worship. There's nothing worse than some Christian come up, hey, buddy, you going through a tough time? You want to pray? You're like, no, I don't want to pray. I don't want to worship. I want to push you into traffic, and I want to camp here in my tragedy. (laughs) But these guys knew that we got a weapon that you can't take away. We got a weapon that nobody gave us so they can't imprison it. It's inside us. And if we can worship God, something's going to change. It is the language of heaven, pastors and leaders. God doesn't hear complaints. He hears worship. And I remember being on a vacation with my family. And I was maybe eight or nine. I could vividly remember it. My dad tells the story the same way. My dad said, son, before you go jump in that pool, please make sure you kind of wade in slowly. And I didn't listen to him, and I jumped in this pool, and I was about to drown. And I remember I could get out one word, and it was dad. 
And like a SWAT team, I remember seeing my dad push through a lot of people, cut his foot coming over a chair, and he came and he grabbed me and he scooped me up. And I looked at him, I said, Dad, how did you hear me? And he said, son, I know your voice. No matter how busy it is, I know your voice. And I just wanted to tell some of you that God knows your voice. And when you find yourself in the fire this year, worship through it. If somebody tells you you're not going to make it, worship through it. If the doctor tells you that you're sick and there is no answer for your ailment, worship through it. If your church can't seem to go forward, worship through it. If everybody's against you, realize that God is for you and worship through it because it'll get your eyes off of the enemy and onto the victory because this fight is won and we're going to worship through it. If you believe it, give God a shout. Come on. Let me pray for you. Every hand lifted towards heaven. Father, I thank you that you're here. And Lord, we declare we will worship through it. You are worthy of all our praise, Lord. We stand here together as churches united. We might sing it different or preach it different. But in the name of Jesus, Lord, we declare you are above it all. And we will fight for you no matter what. We declare victory in our cities. In Jesus' name, if you believe it, give God a shout. Come on.